am Cheryl Giesbrecht. Welcome to our program, Transform Through Truth. I am delighted to offer new insights and practical examples of how real God is. Today, we're going to host a very special guest. You are going to be inspired when you hear her remarkable testimony of God's grace and transforming power. Carol Kent is a best-selling author and speaker. She is internationally known for her dynamic, humorous, encouraging, and biblical truths. Her vibrant personality and relevant messages make her one of the top Christian communicators today. She has traveled with women of faith, extraordinary women, and women of joy arena events. She's also a former radio show co-host whose messages have been featured on Focus on the Family. Through her bold teaching style, you will be irresistibly drawn to see God astonishing grace places in the middle of your roadblocks. When Carol Kent's son was sentenced to life in prison without parole, Carol was consumed with grief, sadness, and despair. She was distraught, wondering why God permitted this to happen. She had prayed for her son since he was a small child. He had been raised with biblical principles and daily prayer. As Carol tried to make sense of everything, she couldn't help ask God, where are you when it hurts so much? In the middle of her sorrow, Carol turned to the place where she had always gone for comfort, the Bible. Today, you're going to find out new truths about where you can find comfort in the middle of a life-altering crisis. You'll also find out how to navigate the holidays when your own family member has been drastically removed from your life. If that's not enough, you will also learn how to hear God speaking to you through scripture. And finally, you're going to learn how to live with confidence despite painful and unfair circumstances. You don't want to miss out on our time with Carol Kent. I'm so excited. Friends, I'm so excited to have one of my good friends right here in studio with us today. And you were part of the introduction and she doesn't need another introduction. So we're just going to go right into our interview of Carol Kent. Welcome, Carol. Thank you so much, Cheryl. It's such an honor to be in the studio with you. Thank you. Well, I can't wait to hear you talk about your new book. And so I'd like you to just open up with how you came about with the idea to write this book. Well, my husband, Gene, and I have an only child, Jason, and uh, he was a, a young man to be proud of. He is a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, and uh, he met and married a previously married woman with two precious little girls. There were multiple allegations of abuse involving the biological father of the girls, and in retrospect, during that first year of marriage, we began to see our son unravel mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, as his fears for his girl's protection really consumed him. And his first assignment out of the continental U.S. was going to be Hawaii, which would mean unsupervised visits for six weeks in the summer. And uh, our, our son seemed overwhelmed with this sense of not being able to protect his girls. And we received a middle of the night phone call in October and it was something so shocking that I, I could hardly catch my breath. Our son had been arrested for the murder of his worst, for the murder of his wife's first husband, and he was in the jail in Orlando. And nausea swept over me. I tried to get out of bed. My legs would not hold my weight. Uh, I finally crawled my way into my office and got a number for the Orlando jail. And that call confirmed the fact that. Uh, we certainly were in a situation that we never anticipated. We went through two and a half years and seven postponements of his trial before he was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole in the state of Florida. That is heartbreaking. I, I mean, most parents would never have, it's, it's your worst nightmare as a parent. Well, it was something we never could have conceived of because our son had never been in trouble before. 
So out of that experience, I began to be desperate for God. I, I kept saying, Lord, why would you have allowed this to happen? Uh, what could we have done to prevent this? Was it something about our parenting that went wrong? What was it? And I began to go to the place I had always gone for answers and for comfort, and that was the living, breathing Word of God. And so I, I really began uh, reading God's Word in a brand new way. And when you are in crisis, sometimes you can't read a whole chapter, but you can read a verse or you can read a couple of verses. And I would pause after I would read a verse or two and I would say, Lord, what are you speaking into my heart as a result of what I'm reading today? And how can I apply it to what I'm going through right now? And so after I would read scripture, I would write out what I believe to be God's prayer over my life based on scripture. And it became such a precious exercise that now many years later, I wrote 365 devotionals in that way based on how I learned to communicate with God through his word and then listen to what he was saying to me. And so he holds my hand, which is the brand new devotional, is based on just listening to his truth and then writing out those prayers. And uh, Cheryl, something I've discovered is that everybody goes through crisis. And my situation felt so desperate. Uh, our son was beaten up severely during his first week of incarceration. And I remember seeing him for the first time with two broken off front teeth and eyes fully bloodshot. I, th I just went out, out to my car after that visit and I said, God, I cannot do this journey. I cannot watch my son suffer like this. Please, God, help me. And, you know, I, I was so feeling at the end of my ability to control a situation. And I'm a firstborn preacher's kid. I know how to control and fix things. But I was in a situation I could not control, but it was the Word of God that was my comfort. Well, when you say, He holds my hand, don't you think sometimes the worst thing or the hardest thing to do is to even put our hand out? So tell us about a time when you were thinking, no, I can't do this anymore. Well, whenever we go through crisis, the enemy comes at us and he comes at us with lies. And he would say things like, if you had been a better parent, this would not have happened. Or if you had read your Bible more consistently, if you had prayed more fervently, this would not have happened. And he's the father of lies, he's a deceiver. And we need to remember that we get through that by going directly to God's truth with a capital T, and that's really what your program, Transformed Through Truth, is all about, because we know apart from what his teachings are and uh, the fact that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost when, when this precious book called the Bible was, was penned, that we're hopeless without his truth in our lives. And that became my life breath when I would just call out to him, both uh, as we waited for that trial, then during the week of the trial, during the, the day when we knew the verdict would be read, and then to the sentencing where I felt like I, I just could not even breathe when I heard that sentence and the, the court TV cameras were in our face and they loved zooming in on the grieving, weeping mama and I couldn't even speak, but it was God's word that held me close. Oh, I imagine that you have lots of wisdom to share with other parents and even siblings of those who are in difficult circumstances, not only incarceration, but maybe other types of prisons. Could you share some of those bits of wisdom for us? I would love to. I think the very first thing I need to say is know that it's okay to experience and express your sorrow. You know, I think sometimes when we've been Christians, especially if we've been in the church for a long time, we think, oh, I need to cover that up. God is my strength. I'm going to get through this. And it is okay with God for you to grieve and share at a heart level how painful this is. And it's, it's okay to weep. I mean, the Bible says God collects our tears in bottles, so they must be very precious to him. And then as time goes by and you find yourself at a point where you can start to breathe again, 
Be as vulnerable as you can in appropriate ways when you are with others. The, the most important step forward for me, apart from God and his word, was to start to be honest with other people about what we were experiencing. And uh, about one in every 100 adults in the United States is in jail or in prison. Those statistics are huge, and yet it's the secret nobody talks about. It's as if, oh, if I were to admit that I have a loved one behind bars, they might think less of me. And I've discovered that when we're honest about our journey and we share what's going on, it opens up the hearts of people. I remember being at the prison on a Christmas day and I was in the ladies' room in one of the stalls and I heard a woman come in. She was hyperventilating, she was cussing, she was crying. She said, I hate this place, I hate these people. I think I'm having a nervous breakdown. And the old professional me would have come out, I would have quoted my five best verses on suffering and I would have said, you'll be fine. But Cheryl, the new broken me began weeping before I ever left that stall. And that day, instead of quoting my verses and instead of saying my prayer, I, I just held a woman who was in pain like I was and I wept with her. That day I didn't do a little sermonette, I just wept with a stranger and that would later earn me the right to share my faith with her. But as I honestly share with others, I've discovered something very special about people. Do you know what? Instead of judging you, most people will be there for you. Most people will pray with you. They will say, how can I help? And I think as all of us open up to each other when we are going through such difficult places, God teaches us that he does cling to our hand and he holds our hand, but he uses his people to be our stretcher bearers, to be those who carry us when we no longer can carry ourselves. And we experience that again and again. I love your faith in, in unquenchable faith. And I don't know what number book that was for you. <laughs> 20 <but> something. Yeah, <laughs> such a great story. Could you share one of the stories from the book of how your faith was strengthen through the people, the believers that were ministering to you. Some people call them stretcher bearers. Yes. And one of the beautiful things in the book Unquenchable and also in When I Lay My Isaac Down, where I share the, our journey through the trial, is that uh, unexpected things happened. One afternoon, my doorbell rang and I was experiencing depression for the first time in my life and it was the florist and i opened the door he said hello lady are you carol kent i said yes i am he said lady it's your lucky day well cheryl i wanted to go tell him to please make somebody else's day lucky i was not in the mood but when you're depressed about all you can do is respond and he handed me one dozen long stemmed yellow roses the most beautiful i had ever seen and I wondered who had graced my day with this beautiful bouquet. And I opened up the card and it was from two of my sisters. It said, Dear Carol, you once gave us some decorating advice. You told us that yellow flowers will brighten any room. We thought you needed a little yellow in your life right now. Love, Bonnie, and joy. And then Cheryl friends came together and they said, we want to put together a monthly email update that will let people know how they can pray and how they can help. We were penniless. It felt like uh, buying another house with the money we had to put together for criminal defense. And I was feeling so desperate and so uh, like I could not even function normally. I was used to multitasking and suddenly I could hardly keep one thought in my head at a time. And uh, it was a, a feeling of weakness but these precious friends came together. And because of those yellow roses, yellow was my color of hope. They sent cards in yellow envelopes, packages in yellow paper, and they found out that my daughter-in-law's favorite color was purple, and she got purple candles, purple paperware, purple Kleenex, I didn't know it came in that color. But we were loved with the love of Jesus through our people who called themselves our stretcher bearers. And one by one, they did what they could to help, and it helped us to refocus on God's word and to find hope in the middle of a desperate situation. One of my favorite stories is our mutual friend, Judy Hampton, oh. and she's now gone to be with yes. Jesus. And um, she's really how I, I heard about you and how I met you was through Judy. 
and she had gone through. Why don't you tell that story? Well, uh, I love that story. Judy and Orvi Hampton were two of the people on our stretcher bearer list. And I was speaking in Southern California one weekend and they asked if they could take us to dinner after the engagement was over. And we had a wonderful time. Many people know that Judy was a really funny and encouraging Bible teacher. And you know she had to have a funny sense of humor because she married a guy named Orvi Euclid Hampton Jr. You have to have a sense of humor to marry that name. And she said the funniest part of that whole story is that the person who filled out our marriage certificate says I'm married to Ovary Euclid Hampton <laughs> Jr. So we laughed hard and then at the end of that dinner she handed me a Bible and she said Carol I, I want you to know I've gone through every chapter in this Bible and I have highlighted every single verse that has the word hope in it. I pray that this will be encouraging to you before you go through the week of the trial. And uh, it, it was so precious to me. I got home and there were two friends, Karen and Betty Jo, who said, we want to take you on a girlfriend's getaway. And at one time, we'd all lived in the city, the same city together, but due to business and ministry moves, we were in different areas. And when I arrived, I knew they planned to make me their guest. They said, you unpack, we'll make dinner. The next morning, we stayed in our robes until noon and drank coffee on the porch. And that afternoon, they got out old-fashioned hymn books, and they, a choir of two, sang to me, an audience of one, the great hymns of the faith I had grown up on. Great is thy faithfulness, O oh God my Father. Amazing grace. They sang every verse for one hour, song after song. And I need to mention, they're not trained musicians. <laughs> out of obedience to the Lord and out of love for me, their friend, they sang to me lyrics based on the Bible that would hold me strong in the middle of a devastating life situation. And then they had scripture ready to read to me and prayed over me. But those are the precious things that often come as we need to cling to an unquenchable faith in the middle of desperate circumstances. I'm just so in encouraged, but I know that it gives a lot of us ideas for those that are in need. And I know that sometimes people feel like they don't know what to do. So what kinds of advice would you give to someone who maybe knows someone who's going through a situation maybe similar in some ways to yours? What would you advise them to do? Well, the first thing I want to say is you don't have to have money to do something meaningful. I found that people would text me their prayer for me that mm -hmm. day, or they would send me an email and say, God put you on my heart, and they would tell me when, and they would share how they would just lift our family to the Lord in prayer. Those things are priceless. And then sometimes people would show up at my door and they knew I was grieving and that relatives were traveling from across the state to come and be with us. And they would see what needed to be done. So without words, they would see if dishes needed to be loaded into the dishwasher or if a carpet needed to be vacuumed. And they would do tangible, loving acts. They would bring meals in. And I remember one precious friend came uh, just through, through email and she said, expect a package on your porch. And the next day, a, a dinner came in, in a frozen package and she said, I live in Texas, and at that time we lived in Michigan. She said, it's customary in our circles to bring dinner to families who are going through hard times, but we live too far apart for me to do that. So I'm sending you dinner in a box, and I pray that when you eat it, you will know our family is praying for you, and we love you. I, I think, Cheryl, rem I want people to remember do one thing for somebody who needs help worse than you do. And it will lift your spirits, it will encourage you, and no matter how small it may seem to you, it will mean the world to the person you're doing it for. That's so good. And oh, it, people need, we all need to be reminded of that because sometimes we think, even through this, Lord, even through this, you really have it covered. You know, you've asked so many questions and now I'm trying to change my, why is this happening into <laughs> how, Lord, can I help? Can you help me get through this? Exactly. And so um, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think one of the things that we need to do is to realize that 
sometimes in this lifetime we don't get the exact answers to our prayer the way we want them mm -hmm. and so something God is teaching me and and uh, some of the entries in he holds my hand talk about the Lord's Prayer and God taught me as I was writing that as I am praying that one day my son might walk in freedom again oh I beg God for that but then I need to say Lord thy will be done. And so I would like everyone watching us today and listening to these words to say, Lord, um, I, I'm praying for my spouse. I'm praying for my child or, or my grandchild or for this work situation or for this ministry or for the brokenness I see in the world. But Father, thy will be done. And then I pray, Lord, reveal to me the step that I need to take because you've put a passion in my heart to do something. You have revealed to me what this need is. And so reveal to me today the one thing I need to do. And sometimes it's talking out loud about what's happening. Sometimes it's doing a tangible act of kindness in Jesus' name. Uh, sometimes it's putting a book in someone's hand who just needs to know that uh, there's hope here. Yeah, I want to turn you to the Lord and to, to understanding what he wants you to learn through this. But keep in mind, no, no act of kindness is too small. Do what God prompts you to do today and then realize that there may be situations where in this lifetime we don't know why he allowed something to happen. And we need to say, Lord, I still trust you. And that's really what it's all about. It's just going back to there's no one else that really we can trust that's right. <laughs> because God is faithful and Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we are just so thrilled that you came by the studio today and I know that you would love to pray for our viewers. So would you like to just take a minute and do that for us? I would love to do that. Oh, Father, our hearts are so full. We know there are people watching right now who are in extremely difficult circumstances. And Lord, some of them have asked for your help and it feels like they aren't being rescued. Some are out there feeling a sense of, of loss over feeling an alienation from you because they have been hurting for a long time and they don't feel the rescue coming. And Lord, I pray that they would hear you say over them, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you. Lord, I pray that each one of them might sense your presence close to them and that as they whisper the sweet name of Jesus, that they would sense that they are not alone, that you won't ever walk away from them. And Lord, we pray that we might be tuned in again to the importance of reading the Bible and that we might respond to the truth that we find there. Lord, our hope is not in what this world offers. Our hope is in you and we cling to you. We need you and we ask you to intervene in our situations. We pray that lives would be transformed through the reading of the truth of the word of God and applying the principles that you give to us there. I pray your protection and your blessing over those who are listening to these words today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today on Transform Through Truth. What a joy it is to go on this journey together as we get to know God better and encourage each other. I am so glad you made the effort and took the time to be here. This is your community where we can grow closer to God together. Today, you might have heard a new truth about what it means to share your testimony. It's important for us to tell our stories. That's what a testimony is. It's an opportunity to tell how God has worked in our lives. When we share our story, it's for God's glory. This lets other people know how God has worked. It's the best way for us to express our gratitude to God. We're also giving God the credit for how he has worked in us and through us. When our lifestyle expresses gratitude to God in front of other people, miracles happen. When you publicly share with others 
what God has done in your life. You give God the credit and it helps you build trust in his power. It gives his grace permission to do so much more in your life. When we share our stories, others notice the amazing power of God. I love the scripture in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. It says, they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Let's pray. Dear Father God, you are so great. You are so mighty. Thank you, God, for giving us stories to share. Thank you for inspiring us to not just keep what you have done to ourselves. Thank you for your word in Lamentations that says, yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So Lord, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait. Lord, help us to wait on you. Some of us have been waiting a very long time for answers, and we know that they are coming. Thank you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd love to continue to pray for you, so please go to my website and share with me your prayer request, your story. It's from ashestobeauty.com. I am so excited to hear how God is working, and I can't wait to hear what he's going to do next. I'm so excited. I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye for now.